Thank you so much for streaming our latest message from First Baptist Church. Here at FBC, our mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. We do that by thinking big, thinking small, thinking in, and thinking out. We hope that this message helps you as you continue to grow in your faith. If you would like to stay connected to FBC, you can visit our website at fbcloyd.ca, look us up on Facebook and Instagram, or download our free mobile app. Now here's the latest from FBC. Enjoy. Well, happy Canada Day long weekend, everyone. I'm always excited to have people here today. I don't know if you guys are just the ones that don't have a cabin at the lake or uh, what's going on there, but I'm always happy I'm not by myself. So whatever the cause, whatever it is, thanks for being here. Um, Most of you, many of you, will know that we've been going through a series on the Gospel of Mark. And um, we've been working our way through this since early February, and it's, uh, we've been just going section by section. And today is the second last week, and it is my last week uh, up here bringing you a part of that Gospel. Next week we are going to have a fellow here, our first camp speaker. Uh, he's a fellow by the name of Cody Matchett comes from Briarcrest College, and he's going to be bringing in Mark uh, for a landing. And so I'm looking forward to that. He's, uh, from everything I know, he's a a good guy and a great speaker. And so uh, I hope you're going to be here for that as well, and we'll finish up the gospel. But for me today, this is the last week. And um, uh, what I want to do is, for those of you that are maybe just catching up um, or that haven't been a part of it, I just want to go quickly through, before we get to our Uh, our section for today. I want to go through um, some of the predictions that Jesus has been making throughout the gospel, because we're going to see a lot of those come to fruition this morning in this specific text. Um, And so we're going to, to, this morning we're going to be in chapter 14, starting in verse 43, and then we're going to be going through to chapter 15, verse 20. And in that section, we'll see uh, Jesus' arrest, and then his interrogation before the Sanhedrin, and then we're, we'll also see his trial, so to speak, in front of Pilate. And we'll go through those ones in order like that. We're going to skip over Peter's denial of Christ, and we'll come back to that at the end. And I want to do that because I think it just kind of gives us a, a better sense of the flow as, as it happened, so to speak, as Jesus was arrested, as he goes before the Sanhedrin, Hedron, as he then goes to Pilate and then on towards his crucifixion. And then we'll come back and look at um, Peter's denial of Christ just as at the end. And so we'll, we'll, we'll do that. But right now, just remember with me the predictions that Jesus has been making as we've gone along throughout the gospel. Jesus early on said that he was going to die, that this path that he was on was going to lead to his death. And this was, of course, just anathema to the people. They, they couldn't understand it. He was, what they were hoping was the Messiah. He was supposed to be victorious. He was supposed to be the one that was going to deliver them out of the hands of the Romans and, and restore them to their independence and prosperity and all the things that go with it. And, and what's more was that Jesus said that he's not only going to just die, but that he was going to die on a cross, which was at the hands of the Romans, at the hands of the very ones that he was supposed to be delivering them from. Then Jesus expanded on it a little bit, and he said that his death would come as a result of the religious authorities, as a result of the high priests, elders, the scribes, the teachers of the law. And specifically concerning his death, he he outlined, he indicated that he would be handed over to the Gentiles, that they would mock him, that they would spit on him, that they would flog him. And we can see these predictions in a number of different places, but especially in chapter 10, verse 33, and then also way beyond that, way earlier than that, back in Isaiah 50, verse 6, as Isaiah prophesied about what would happen to this coming servant of God. 
Most recently, Jesus has foretold the disciples that one of them would betray him. That his betrayal that would lead to his death would come as a result of one of his inner circle. And he indicated as well that not only would he be betrayed by the one, but that all of his disciples would abandon him. That they all would desert him. That no one would stick around and support him through about what was to come next. And lastly, then Jesus looked at Peter and told Peter that before the cock crows twice tonight, you'll deny me three times. So before we dive in and pick up where we left off last week, let's just stop and pray once more, and then we'll carry on. Father, this morning, we come before you again and we say thank you for so many things. Thank you today and this weekend for our country that we still have the freedom that allows us to come together today. That we would be able to come together and worship you, focus on you today in public, speak of you today in public, without fear of persecution. Thank you for this time that we have to spend doing that. I pray that you would work in our hearts and our minds. Father, Though as we consider life in our country today, Lord, we see this freedom eroding. We see our country increasingly turning our back on you. And God, we recognize that truth sets us free. That freedom comes from truth, and that is you. So this morning, God, I would pray that even as we consider the text of today, that you would help us to turn back to you. That we would see you for who you are. And that that would motivate us, that that would change us. Lord, this morning I pray that by your Spirit that you would work in our hearts and our minds to that end. We recognize that we cannot, in and of ourselves, turn towards you. That we are incapable of that on our own. So we need your help. We need your participation with us here this morning. By your Spirit, come and work in our hearts and our minds. Open our eyes. Remove the scales that we might see you. That we might know you. That we might turn to you. That we might allow you into our lives. That you would be able to work on us. That you would be able to bring us the freedom that we need. That we long for. The relationship, a restored relationship with you. That would set us free. And Father, to that end then, I ask all of this in light of what Christ has done for us. And in his name I pray, amen. All right, so what I want to do is um, I'm going to start, rather than in 43, I'm going to drop back and, and start in verse 41 which will give us just a little bit of continuity from where we were last. And you'll remember that Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples, and he was praying there before he was about to start to face this next stage, this next step in his suffering, in this passion of Jesus, the passion of the Christ, the suffering of the Christ. And so he went to pray, and... As he prayed, three times he came back to the disciples who had fallen asleep. 
And this is where we're going to pick it up in verse 41 as he comes back for the third time. Returning the third time, Jesus said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough! The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now I appreciate, let's just stop there for a moment. I appreciate the fact that Mark is specific and he's precise about what he's writing here this morning. Judas was a common name at the time. And despite the fact that we've heard that Jesus was going to be betrayed by one of his own, Mark is taking no chances that we would be misunderstanding or misconstruing what's going on here. He underlines for us the fact that Judas, one of the twelve, has come. Mark wants no second guessing. Here's the betrayer. Carrying on, verse 44. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with him, with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. And therein, Christ's prediction is fulfilled. Judas, one of the twelve, one of Jesus' inner circle, has betrayed him. And after a, a little bit of a back and forth, we read in verse 50, then everyone deserted him and fled. Things start to get a little dicey. Things start to heat up. And everyone disappears. All the disciples are gone. And Christ's next prediction is fulfilled. Now, I put verse 51 and 52 in here just kind of for interest sake because I don't know if you're like me but for me verses 51 and 52 stand out as a little odd as we're reading this account it says a young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus when they seized him he fled naked leaving his garment behind now like the first account of a streaker in Scripture. What's up with that? And we're not 100% sure. There's a number of people that would subscribe to the idea that this is Mark actually writing himself into the text, letting people know that, that he actually was a part of this as well, that he witnessed some of the things that he's writing about. And that he was here for this occasion and is writing about it firsthand. Perhaps. Or it may have been that Mark notes it in order to underline the complete abandonment of Jesus. That not only did everyone flee, but that some of them were going so hard to get out of there that they were leaving their clothes behind. That as the, the mob is starting to try and react to what's going on, as they're trying to accomplish this purpose for which they've been sent by the religious authorities, that they're grabbing these guys and, and, and then they'll, they'll do anything to get away, including doff their clothes and run. Now, it's true that what lay ahead for Christ, what was coming next for him, was something that only Jesus could do alone. There was no one else that was going to be able to walk the path that lay ahead. 
And so Jesus is the only one that could do it. But it is also very true and very evident that he was going to have to go it alone because everyone else was gone and no one was willing to go with him. He was deserted and abandoned. And again, you and I see our similarity with the disciples. As we recognize in ourselves our abandonment, our abandonment of Christ in the days of our lives, in the hours of our days, Verse 53 to 65 carries on. It says that this mob took Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests, the elders and the teachers of the law, sorry, took him to the high priest and all the chief priests, the elders and the teachers of the law came together. And this fulfills that next prophecy. Again, Mark said initially that the mob was sent by the religious authorities, but he wants no, no doubt, no question, no one able to, to call into question if that was actually the case. He underlines for us again that they brought Jesus to the Sanhedrin. And now the Sanhedrin was the highest echelon of religious authority for the Jewish people. It was composed of the, the high priest, the chief priest, the elders, and the scribes. And so they bring Jesus, even at this late hour, to an examination, if you will, and almost an examination for discovery, to establish the evidence that they need to charge Christ with a capital crime. And now remember that they weren't here to just arrest Christ. They weren't here to just simply imprison him. They weren't trying to just derail him at this point. They were here to take him out. They wanted him dead. And for that, they needed a capital crime, a crime punishable by death. And at first, it seems that they're having a little bit of trouble. Which is, if I'm Mark, I take great delight in writing about. Because you've got to think, it's awfully hard to impugn someone perfect. And so they set out to try and charge him, but they're having problem corroborating with their witnesses. And as a part of the law, it was a requirement that a crime on this level had to be corroborated by two or three witnesses. We can see that as we go back to Deuteronomy. Back to the Old Testament, Leviticus. They needed enough witnesses to corroborate the crime in order to take someone's life. And this isn't initially going well. The witnesses aren't working together properly. And so, again, just some Dougology again. I think, that, I think that the high priest gets a little agitated. Come on, boys. Get this together. And so he steps in, frustrated at what's going on. And we pick it up there again in verse 60. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? This would be better translated as a statement with a question mark at the end of it. Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus replies, I am said Jesus. 
And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. And at this, the high priest tears his clothes. Verse 63, the high priest tore his clothes. Why do you, why do you need any more witnesses? He asked them. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? All the rest of the Sanhedrin condemned him. They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists, and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. Now, as we read this, if you're again like me, and hopefully you're not, you don't need that baggage. But as I read this, I look at this and I think to myself, well, what on earth? All Jesus says is, I am. He answers the question. And then he says something or other about, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Well, what on earth in that statement constitutes so blatant an offense that the chief priest would rip his clothes. Ripping clothes at the time was, was a symbol of the travesty that, that just had happened. Something so catastrophic, something so abhorrent that you wanted absolutely nothing to do with it. That you didn't want to be associated with it at all. And so the, the chief priest rips his clothes. And we look at this sentence in front of it and say, well, what on earth could provoke that? Well, it was in this statement that the Jews found what they needed, that the Sanhedrin found what they needed. Because blasphemy was a crime which was punishable by death. It was a capital crime. And usually you would be executed by stoning. And so it wasn't that Jesus had just admitted to being the Messiah. That wasn't the problem. Anybody could do that. There's other evidence and testimony for others having claimed to be the Messiah then as well. And you would do so to your own chagrin, possibly your own endangerment, definitely your own mocking. But that wasn't the crime. The problem was this. In his answer, Jesus references Psalm 110 and Daniel 7, verse 13. And in so doing, he refutes all of the accusations against him, along with the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. He refutes their accusations, and he refutes them as well. As he references those two verses, those two two sections of scripture. The charges against him have been that he's been a false prophet. And Jesus answers to that a resounding no, I am not a false prophet. I am a prophet from God. The chief priests, the religious authorities, have questioned his authority, Christ's authority, most recently in the temple as Jesus has been teaching there. And they've come to him and they're upset about this authority. Whose authority are you teaching by? On whose behalf are you here? And they question it. To which Jesus answers here again, I am here under the authority of God. These two passages talk about him as the, the son of God, the, the, the representative God of God, who God will vindicate. And so Jesus says, all these accusations, I deny. And what's more, I'm sitting in judgment of you. I will be coming in judgment of you. You will see me at the right hand of the Father. And implied in that is that their problem is, is going to be coming soon. Implicit in his response, is that he will be vindicated by God 
and will rule over them. At that, the chief priest constituted a a charge of blasphemy. And the rest of the Sanhedrin agreed and support him in that, in that. And therefore, they had arrived at a capital crime. But there was another problem, another wrinkle. Because the Sanhedrin could not independently pronounce a death sentence. At one time they would have been able to, but not since the Romans had come to town. The Romans had arrived, and now the Jewish people were under their authority and... Therefore, nobody was getting executed without the Romans approving it. So a second step was necessary. Another stage was necessary in this process. Jesus had to be taken before Pilate. So no problem. We can get him before Pilate. But there was a problem. Because blasphemy wasn't a capital offense for the Romans. And so we see now the religious authorities take Jesus' response, their verdict of blasphemy, and they massage it just enough to become a charge of treason. Implied in Christ's response that he would rule over them, that God would vindicate him, and that then he would sit in judgment over the religious authorities was this idea that now Jesus was claiming to be the authority. And therefore, he was in competition to to Caesar. That he was now a threat to the empire. And so, they go and take him to Pilate. And we pick it up in chapter 15, verse 1. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. So they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Now that strikes me as weird too. Maybe it strikes you as weird. Like, I mean, this is happening in the middle of the night. What's going on? This doesn't make any sense. What kind of kangaroo court happens in the middle of the night? But for the Romans, their court proceedings began at daybreak because for the upper echelon of society, by mid-morning, They were off to their leisure pursuits. So everybody who's anybody has to get things done early in the morning. And so the Sanhedrin wanted Jesus at Pilate's doorstep, on his doorstep, in time for court at daybreak. And as they arrive, we see that they've been in conversation with Pilate. They've filled him in because... Verse 2, Pilate begins with, Are you the king of the Jews? So he knows. It's, he, they, they've set it up. Pilate is now looking at this as a treason case. Where Jesus is being presented as a threat to the Roman Empire. And after some give and take, as Pilate starts to try and flesh this out, and as as he's having trouble being convinced of the legitimacy of the charges, he finally arrives at the idea of, I'm going to offer this prisoner exchange that was somewhat common at the time. And he offers to release Barabbas, or to, to, um, instead of releasing Barabbas, to release Christ. But the people are having none of that. We pick it up again in, in verse 12. What shall I do then with this one you call the king of the Jews, Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Just as we hit this section, note again and be reminded, remember as we talked about how Herod offered up John the Baptist's head. Despite the fact 
that he didn't want to. Despite the fact that he didn't think that John the Baptist deserved it. But because of the pressure that he was under from his wife and from his peers, he succumbed to the pressure and sent for John's head. Here, Pilate, in the same way, though not convinced of the crime, under pressure from the religious authorities and from the people, fearing for his reputation, fearing for what might happen and what he might be held responsible for, he succumbs and offers up an innocent Jesus to be crucified. Verse 16, the soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put on his own, his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. Here, we see the fulfillment of Christ's prediction that he would be turned over to the Gentiles and that he would be mocked, that he would be spit on, and that he would be taken to his death. And we see he's well on his way there as Pilate sentences sentences him to crucifixion. And we'll leave that now for Cody next week. But before we finish today, let's go back and take a look at chapter 14, verses 66 to 72, where we find Peter's denials of Christ. Verse 66, while Peter was below in the courtyard, we hear through the text before this that that Peter, after fleeing a safe distance, then followed the mob as they took Jesus back to the home of the high priest. So he's been following at a distance. And he comes then into the courtyard of the high priest's home. While Peter was below in the, in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also... We're with that Nazarene Jesus, she said. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. Again he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. Clearly here, we have found the fulfillment of Jesus' prediction to Peter. But we've found more than just that. In this passage, Mark once more in his gospel points us to what it means to be a disciple of God, a follower of God, as he contrasts Jesus and Peter. under interrogation and pressure from the high priest and Pilate, Jesus maintains his integrity but forfeits his life. While under interrogation and pressure, from a few people, Peter forfeits his integrity to maintain his life. 
It's interesting to see the progression of Peter's denial. It begins with that of just a slave girl coming and accusing him of being a follower of Jesus. She had no authority. She had no real ability to cause him issues. But even under that little pressure, Peter succumbs and denies Jesus. And it's not surprising then, I suppose, that at the next step with a few more people and a little bit more pressure, he succumbs again until finally the whole crowd in the courtyard accuse him and he begins to swear that he has no idea who this guy is. Do you recognize that in your life today? I recognize it in mine. And so often, even under the little bits of pressure, let alone the bigger pieces, the bigger challenges, I deny God. I turn my back on Him. Heaven forbid that somebody see me pray in public. When somebody asks me what I do for a living, oh, I work at a church. And I deny God. This morning, in Jesus and His appearance before the authorities, we find the standard for following Christ. It's perfection. And in Peter this morning, we find our problem, our inability to meet God's standard. Romans 3.23 says, For all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's standard. And Romans 3.10 says, There is no one righteous, not even one. And for that reason this morning, church family and friends, For that reason, we need a Savior. We need a Savior. So in answer to our need, Jesus now, completely rejected and alone, carries on to the cross for you and for me to pay the penalty of our sin the debt of our sin that we cannot pay alone, but that we're all guilty of having denied God, having turned our backs on Him. For that need, Christ carries on to the cross. Now I suppose that we could leave it here this morning with us all doomed to failure as followers of Christ. And maybe some of us have left it here today. Maybe you're here this morning and you feel that you've been crushed under the weight of your failure in your faith. Your inability to meet the pressure of the interrogation that you face, the challenge that you face day in and day out, that you've succumbed over and over, and as a result, you're feeling weak and impotent in your faith today. But listen, Peter And the rest of the disciples can represent for us today another way again. 
They can be representative of us today in yet a different way. In that they didn't give up in their failure. They didn't give up in their failure. They chose instead to be forgiven. They chose to be forgiven. This is the end of Peter in Mark's account. But it was not the end of Peter. We see him come back and do amazing things for God after having denied him so completely, so dramatically. Three times. Christ restored him as he did the other disciples. And they went on to do amazing things for God because they saw him resurrected. You and I today look back and we see a resurrected Christ. And we don't have to live in failure anymore. We don't have to live separated from God All throughout his book, Mark has been asking the question, posing the question to us. We know his answer, but what is your answer today? Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Mark claims that he is the Son of God, here to forgive us for our sin to raise us back up and help deliver us and build us into the people that he wants us to be. Will you recognize him today as God? Will you subscribe? Will you choose to follow him and allow him to work in your life? All for the sake of of God's Son, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, today, again, God, I would ask, I pray, I plead with you that you would come now and that you would work. As we've walked through Mark's gospel and are now at literally the foot of the cross, I pray that you would remove the scales from our eyes, that you would remove the hurdles that we place between ourselves and you, that we would see you for who you are, that we would recognize Jesus as your son, that we would understand the intent that you have been at work about since the beginning of time to reestablish a relationship with us despite and over our sin which we've committed against you. Father, this morning I pray that we would Forgive, ask for forgiveness, seek your forgiveness so that you could restore us, so that you could build us back into a people, your people, restored in a relationship with you and build us and make us into a testimony to the world around us of your saving grace. That we would choose not to be failures, but rather forgiven all for Jesus' sake. And in his name I pray, amen.